to keynote here. Um, so one of the key things that I want to get across in this presentation is why Omega is a valuable tool, or why Omega 3 is a valuable tool for developers who are creating sites for clients. And our particular clientele is one of those key reasons. Um, and so we'll take a look at that. All right. So I just said this, this session's about Omega-3, not Omega-4. So why is that? Um, we'll look at what Omega is in a, in a little bit. But for those of you who've been sort of looking at Omega, who are interested in playing with it and installing it, the differences between Omega-3 and Omega-4, Omega-4 was just released. It is a significant overhaul of Omega. Omega-3 and Omega-4 are two completely different tool sets. So um, that's a, a very important thing to consider when you're looking at which one you're going to use. Omega-4 is touted to be lightweight, flexible, primarily managed in code. I haven't had the opportunity to play enough with it to say that I agree or disagree with that. Um, Jeremy, have you? No. Um, Omega-4 is specifically built to solve a lot of the things that most of us themers like to whine about, which is... Omega-3 has a lot of the theming in the Drupal configuration, and we do whine about that a lot, and <laughs> Omega-4 has taken that out. Unfortunately, that tool set that we, and Jeremy and I have had these conversations, like to whine about is the very thing that makes Omega-3 an incredibly valuable tool for the specific types of use cases that we're going to be looking at today. Um, Omega-4 really is for intermediate or advanced users, themers. So it's, you know, one, it's yet another great or probably great base theme that's out there and available uh, along with Zen and Adaptive Theme and a lot of the other tools that are out there. Omega-3, on the other hand, um, was one of the first kind of fully featured responsive base themes that was out there for Drupal when responsive became incredibly popular. So it's had a long tradition of being long in the world of responsive, um, tradition of being a solid base theme for responsive Drupal sites. Its style sheet structure absolutely forces the developer to think mobile first. You have no choice. With Omega-3, if you don't think mobile first, your process of theming your site will take probably four to five times longer than it will if you think mobile first. And I think that's a great asset of the theme, that it really doesn't give you the option. That's how you have to think. Omega-3 is a great theming option for beginners to the Drupal world who want to create their own theme, who really want to customize the look all the way through. It's great for handing over to a low-skill client. Again, going back to the specific use cases that we have with the clients that, that we work with. Libraries. They, some libraries have the funds to have a Drupal developer on staff, and those libraries are wonderful to work with, and, um, and I'm really happy for them. They're, they're, great, um, they're great clients, but many libraries don't have that kind of resource. They have people who really want to give the best that they can, and unfortunately, they're also trying to do that in a hundred other areas, and their skills are not specifically web development. So they're going to be taking on the long-term maintenance of, this, of their site that we hand them. Omega-3 is probably the only theme that really makes that doable in a low-budget situation. And I just want to reiterate what makes Omega-3 something that those of us who do a lot of theming whine about is the very thing that makes it fantastic for beginners. Um, great resource. So if you're new to Drupal, you're just getting started, and you want to do an amazing theme that makes you look like an expert, Omega-3 is a really good tool to get you in the game. Uh, so we're going to head over to a couple of examples of the Omega-3 theme in, well, one example of the Omega-3 theme in action, and then a couple of examples of where Omega-3 would be really helpful. So because Omega-3 allows you to do a lot of the theming work 
in, uh, in the configuration, you can hand over a theme to a client such as this. This is one that we launched a couple of months ago. Um, and this is a project that's part of the New York, uh, sorry, the New Jersey State Library. Um, this is a fully responsive theme and they have, this was one of many projects that they wanted to do and they wanted to have exactly the same theme across all of their projects. They don't want to have to uh, spend some of their very limited budget on developers every time they're spinning up a new campaign. So they want to be able to take the theme that we gave them and just plaster it onto other campaigns just like that and make a couple of changes without knowing any code or touching the files on their server and have the other campaigns look unique. So here's two other campaigns. This is the base campaign. This is the hub for all of the campaigns. And here's two spin-offs. You can see it's exactly the same theme, but they're able to have different colors, a different, you know, this has, this has its own branding. It has um, all the flyers for the outspoken campaign come out in these colors, so they were able to do this. Likewise, another campaign that they have, something a little bit more muted than outspoken because it's for businesses, different colors, different branding, very easy for them to do. Um, they could also be, they could also take opportunities to change layout a bit if they wanted to. They haven't done that yet, but because of the way that Omega 3 works, they're able to if they want to. And I'm just going to quickly show you a couple of other use cases where the Omega 3 theme would be really useful. And we may consider moving the client over to that, uh, over to Omega 3, but aren't, these are not currently in Omega 3. So here's two examples from the UCLA School, uh, the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. These are departments and centers within the school. Um, so two, two different departments that use the same theme and then two other, uh, two centers that use the same theme. So these are not Omega, but these are instances where Omega might be a good, a, a good option. It may not, so that's something that always needs to be considered. Whenever you're choosing a theme, there are a lot of considerations that you want to make. Um, so, the, again, going back, the very reason why, uh, the very thing that we like to complain about with Omega-3, the very thing that Omega-4 solves, is also the very thing that makes it an excellent starting point and an excellent resource for creating something that you have to turn over to low-skilled clients. So I'm just going to close all of these so that they're not in our way. And we'll go in and start taking a look at this particular theme. So how many of you have something running with the Omega 3 theme installed? Not that many. Um, how many of you are considering setting up a site with Omega? A good number. Okay. Um, has anyone installed Omega 4? Started playing with it? Great. Okay, well, hopefully during the Q&A you can talk a little bit to it if, uh, if there's time and you want to. All right, so installing Omega. One of the... <clears throat> Omega has a number... One of the great things about Omega 3, at least, is that it comes with some helper modules. They are separate projects on Drupal.org. You do not need to install them to use Omega. If you want to use the Omega theme, you can just get started download Omega, and go, but the helper tools will make your experience um, better with using Omega as long as you take the time to kind of piece them all together and why they're useful. So Omega is the base, is the base theme that you'll start with. Omega Tools, Delta, and Context are three projects that work with Omega and get you going with, uh, with a lot of configuration options. Omega Tools and Delta are specifically for Omega 3. They do not work with Omega 4, um, and they're not really independent modules. Context is a great independent module that you can use um, in some ways as an alternative to panels, in some ways for its own purposes. It's kind of an all-purpose module that you might play with. And we're going to look a little bit at context because it is very valuable as part of the Omega 3 toolset. 
So when you install Omega, you have a couple of choices. Uh, the one that I always prefer is the manual method. Find the starter kit, change the names, do all the work myself because that's what I like to do. However, Omega Tools gives you a very easy way. Once you have Omega installed, once you've downloaded Omega and, you've, and you have Omega Tools enabled on your, um, on your site, we'll head over to Modules here so that you can see the Omega Tools module. By the way, this module that I'm using to make the interface for my modules a little bit more friendly is called Module Filter. So Omega Tools, it's its own module. It's specifically designed to work with the Omega theme, and it does need to be enabled. But once you have the Omega theme on your site and the Omega Tools module enabled, you can, in order to install a new Omega sub-theme so that you're not editing your base theme, simply go under Appearance, Create New Omega Sub-Theme, and it'll walk you through the process. And just to step back for anyone in this room who really is new to Drupal, it's really important that you make a sub-theme rather than work with the master, the, the base theme that you've downloaded from Drupal.org. And the reason for that is because over time there will be security updates for the theme, there will be changes that come out, and you want to make sure that anything that's unique to you is in a separate file set so that when you run your security updates, you replace the base theme and your independent work remains untouched. If you don't do that, then whenever you do a security update, you could actually lose all of the work that you've done. So you always want to start with a base theme rather than hack the original theme. So from here, from this interface, I can give my theme a name and it'll automatically give it a friendly machine name. I can tell it to install automatically or not. So if I actually want it to go into my folder, my themes directory, I can tell it to do that. This makes it super easy. I do need to have right access for the, the Drupal user, not the Drupal user, but the user on my system that, um, that all of my Drupal files are connected to needs to have right access to that particular directory. So you'll want to make sure that you have that. And then I can say which base theme I want to use. This is for, specifically for Benno, <laughs> um, this is pretty cool here because what it's doing is it's not just finding the Omega base theme that I already downloaded into my folder, into my themes directory. It's also seeing all of the base themes, or sorry, all of the sub-themes I've already created. So from here, I can actually say I want this particular theme that I'm creating right now, this particular sub-theme that I'm creating right now, to be a sub-theme of a sub-theme, as opposed to just a sub-theme of Omega, so that it looks at all of the work that I've already done on one of those other themes. This would be relevant to you if you are using um, you know, commerce or one of, these, uh, one of these profiles that comes with an Omega sub-theme already created that you then want to work with. This could also be relevant to you if you do work with a school or a library um, or a large group that has many different departments and everybody wants to share a theme um, or share a base theme that you've kind of created for that particular group. And just don't do this. Always start with a starter kit. Notice it says here this is not recommended. So you'll want to, at this point in time, you'll really want to start with the Omega HTML5 starter kit. Um, because at this point, it, it's worthwhile to just be working in HTML5, even if you're not familiar with HTML5. Omega takes care of a lot of that on the back end. And then from there, you'll just click Save and Continue. It will create the theme. It will place it into your themes directory for you, as long as you have right permissions. And then, um, and then you'll be able to work with those theme files from there. So super easy. The manual method of creating a sub-theme, I would love to go into that, but we don't have a lot of time. So 
rather than actually showing you how to manually create a sub-theme, um, I'll show you where that'll happen. So all of your themes go into your themes directory. So in your, uh, you have your, your Drupal root, which for me is code, and then you have sites, all themes. And all of your themes, unless you're dealing with multi-site and have special requirements, all of your themes belong in that sites, all themes directory. So once you place Omega in there, inside of the Omega directory, you have a starter kits directory. From starter kits, you'll grab the starter kit that you want to work with. And more likely than not, it's going to be Omega HTML5. And all you need to do is duplicate it, rename it. Yes, if this is too beginner for you, please don't hesitate to head out. I completely understand. And drag it out into the top level of your themes directory. And then you're going to need to rename other, other things within here. But what you'll do is you'll follow the readme.txt file right here. It's really specific on how to create your own sub-theme manually. You'll just follow that piece by piece. And it's, it's great, so as long as you follow that, you'll have your sub-theme, it'll be all set, and you're good to go. The only reason why the manual method is my preferred method is because it always has been. Um, I don't know that there's really any reason to do one or the other, except for what works best for you. Once you have your theme installed, just like with any other theme, going back to our site here, once you have your theme installed, then you'll need to enable it. So under the Appearance menu here, um, in your Drupal 7 site, it'll list all of the themes that you have in your, in your themes directory on your site. And you'll find the theme that you have, and you can enable it, or you can enable it and set it to the default. If it's the default, it's what everybody will see. If you just enable it, then you can switch to that theme if you want to and work with it while other people are seeing whatever the default is. This is really great if you're working on a theme that's really not ready for anybody to see yet and, um, and you want to make sure that they can, um, you want to make sure that they can use the site, continue editing their content, doing whatever they need to, and not see the rather messy thing that you're working on at that given point in time. So to enable a theme, you would just click the enable link right there. It's fairly straightforward. But once you have it installed, now it's time to configure it. And this is where Omega 3 is incredibly powerful. So we're going to head over to under appearance to settings. Right now the default theme is Omega Fun. So we'll head over to Omega Fun and take a look at all of the configuration options that are available directly in the interface. What's up? There you go. <laughs> all right. Um, so this is where all of, all, basically all of the configuration happens. Your styling, your CSS, still needs to happen in your style sheets for the most part. Um, it should happen in the style sheets, but sometimes you'll have someone that you can't give access to the style sheets to. We'll talk about that as well and what your options are there. And there are a lot of options right here for you. So when you're configuring Omega in the configuration itself, there are a number of things that you have control over. You have control over weight of your elements and position of your elements. Weight and position have to do with placement in the code versus placement on the screen. And I'm going to show you an example of why that's really important. And this is, again, this goes back to why Omega 3 is a great tool for beginners, because it doesn't take a, a sophisticated knowledge of grids or CSS to be able to use Omega 3 to set your weights and positions uh, on, on your particular elements. You can also move your zones and regions around. You can create new zones and regions. You can create custom classes for your zones and regions if you want to do something fancy with your CSS. 
And Omega-3 also has an extra library, a couple of extra libraries. The one that I particularly find helpful for beginners is Equal Heights, which, you know, when you see a site that has the sidebar is just as tall as the content area, um, no matter how long one or the other is, and whatever designs are in the background on those, they're equally heighted. That looks really nice. It's not necessarily an easy thing for beginners to do, and Omega just gives you a, a couple of checkboxes to click, and suddenly you have equal heights all over your site, wherever you want them. So going back here, looking at Omega, this is the configuration area. I'm going to go back to the home screen and show you a couple of the, the fun things that you have available to you when you just start getting set up. What you have, when you first enable Omega, you're going to see the grid and the blocks already outlined for you. So when you first enable Omega, it's going to look like this, which can be a little bit overwhelming. The first time you see this, you enable Omega and you look at this and, and it looks crazy and you're wondering how to get beyond that. Well, this is incredibly useful because it's showing you the grid that Omega is using. Omega 3 uses the 960 grid, which we'll take a look at in a moment. It shows that to you so that you can actually see where your elements, what, what your elements are taking up in terms of screen space and how they're balanced with each other. You can also see the blocks that are available to you, and these blocks are actually your regions in your Omega theme. They're not Drupal blocks, they're regions. So they probably should be called debugging region, not debugging block, um, so, that, so that it's a little bit clearer. So you can see all of those outlined right away. And in the configuration itself, you can go to your debugging screen and turn those off. You know, by, they're, they're gonna be on by default, and that's why it's gonna look overwhelming. So you can just go into your configuration for your particular theme and turn them off. And you can also, if you're leaving them on, you can say who can still see them. So if you don't want the client, for example, to be able to see those right now because they might be confusing to them, you can make them unavailable to whatever roles your client has. And so that's quite simple. When we say 960 grid, what we're talking about is a column grid where you have the pink lines, which you can barely see, are basically the, the grid lines. The white lines in between, those are gutters between the areas where, where content can be. And that first one, that 941, that's a 12 column element. And then you can also have other elements taking up different columns within the grid. So the first one takes up one column on the left, that's 61, and then the 860 is taking up another 11 columns. So this allows you to really refine what your elements are taking up in terms of screen space. And I'm going to leave you with the URL to this particular blog post that has this and a lot of other information on the 960 grid, because understanding it is really key to working with Omega 3 as an option. Um, there are a lot of other grids out there that a lot of other themes use, but if you're going to use Omega, you really need to um, have an understanding of how the 960 grid works. Excuse me, is there a yes. reference to that site uh, on the Omega site? Do you have a, no. somewhere you have resources on your, on your website you recommend that 960 page as well as other um, I'll leave you with the URL for that particular one, and then we'll post these these slides somewhere so that you can get to that to that link. Yes, but the URL is in the slides at the end, so you'll you'll get it. It's a great blog post to to read to really get comfortable with it. So I'm going to turn these debugging blocks off because they obviously do change your layout, and if you're thinking aesthetically, it can be a little bit complicated. And I'm going to show you something really quickly. The difference. What we have here, done entirely through using Omega configuration, context, and delta, with no help at all from the CSS files, we have your normal layout for the site. And then I'm just going to click on this one link. And now we have a section that looks entirely different. 
Notice if I go to this page, I have the left sidebar, I have the content area, I have space for a right sidebar. And then if I pop over here, I don't have the left sidebar, I don't have the right sidebar, and I'm just seeing, uh, I'm seeing a pink background and things look different. They just, overall, they look different. So this is all done through configuration modules. Again, if you're a themer, you're probably thinking, that's horrible. Um, but for people really getting started with Drupal, it's incredibly valuable as a resource to get going and get a nice site up and running. All right, so I want to talk about weight and position because weight and position are one of the most important things when you start thinking about a mobile site. So if I resize this right now, watch what happens with that navigation bar, the search bar and navigation bar on the left. It pops up to the top. Now if I'm using an iPhone, I'm going to be rather disappointed when my, imagine, I mean those left sidebars can get really dense. You could have long list of links, this can get pretty overwhelming. So if I, if I do this and I'm using a mobile device, I'm going to be unhappy because I'm now going to have to scroll really far to get the content that I'm trying to see. You can fix that with CSS, but the nice thing about Omega-3 is that it also allows you to fix it using the configuration with weight and position. In the 960 grid world, weight and position are called push and pull. So if you do start investigating 960 grid and you see push and pull, just keep in mind that Omega-3 is using weight and position for the same language. So in order to fix this, I'm going to go back over to my configuration. And I'm going to go into zone and region configuration. This is where the UI power of Omega-3 really lies. And in zone and region configuration, I'm going to go into my content section, but first I'm going to just show you a little bit. I'm making this smaller that, so that you can see more at once, and then we'll make it bigger so that you can see what it says. But you'll see that this is broken up into sections. So first you have the header section, then you have the content section. As we scroll down, you have the footer section. Within each of those sections, you have zones. So you have the user zone, the branding zone, the menu zone, and the header zone. Within the zones, let's look in content, you have regions. So inside of the content zone, you have sidebar first, content, and sidebar second. And these are going to be listed here in the order that they'll appear in the code. Not necessarily the order that they'll appear on the screen, but the order that they'll appear in the code. And that's important to think about. So if we look at this here, we're looking at the regions here sidebar first, content sidebar second. If we flip over here, we see sidebar first, content, sidebar second. And I'm seeing the space for sidebar second right now because I'm logged in as somebody who can see the overall grid and debugging blocks. If I were looking at this as your typical user, not logged in, um, please don't restart Firefox right now, if I were doing that, um, as a typical user, notice that it fills the entire space. It doesn't show me the empty areas. So that's something to keep in mind when you're theming because a lot of people theme and forget to check what the non-authenticated user is seeing and you could create something pretty messy as a result. So, um, so I'm seeing sidebar first, content, sidebar second. What I want to have happen is I still want sidebar first to visually display in that first spot. But I want it to be in the second spot in my code. And what that'll automatically then do as well is when I resize it, it'll keep what's first in the code up top for me. So going back over here, we're going to take a look at these. I'm going to open them up, sidebar first, content and sidebar second. And there's a lot to see here, so we'll probably just do a lot of scrolling. So sidebar first has weight of one and position of negative one. Content has a weight of two and position of zero. 
and sidebar second has a weight of three and a position of zero. In the Drupal world, the lower the number, the higher the item goes. So it floats to the top, it sinks to the bottom. And that's true with blocks, that's true with everything. Float, it, lower number floats, lightweight floats, so negative numbers will go top, and then heavy numbers, the larger numbers, will sink to the bottom. So what I want to do then is looking at weight, which is my code placement for the item, I need to order these in, the, in how I want them to display in the code. So I'm going to put sidebar second at weight of 2. Well, actually, I like 0 as the base, so I'm going to put 0 for content because I want that first. Sidebar first as 1, and then sidebar second will be 2. So these are the weight of the items. Position, in terms of how they display visibly, I want content to be first. So I'll leave that as zero, and then I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I don't want content to be first. I want sidebar first to be first. So I'm gonna put the position of content to one, the position of sidebar first up to zero, and then sidebar second to two. And then I'll go ahead and save that. Mm -hmm. So typically things start as a default of zero, and this, this is really seen a lot in the blocks configuration, um, especially if you start using context or other modules to position your blocks. You'll have everything at zero. And sometimes you'll just have so many things going on that you're going to need to take something into the negative number because you're not going to want to move all of your zero items to a positive number in order to get something higher than it. So the negative numbers just allow you to have that flexibility when things start to get really big and you already have a bunch of things that are zero. Does that make sense? It's kind of hard to explain, but... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the the additional question there was: Is it if it if it has a negative number, is it still viewable on the screen? And it absolutely is. The negative numbers don't actually position things higher on the page; they just determine the order that things appear within their section. So they're not actually gonna. It's not like giving it a negative margin in your CSS and and you know sending it up somewhere. It's simply you, you have three elements which one's first in line, and the negative numbers kind of give you the flexibility to set your line order accordingly. Okay, so I've saved that. Now I'm gonna go ahead and reload this page, and everything still looks exactly the same. This is still in the spot that we want it to be in, but if I shrink this, notice now the content comes up first, and scrolling down, We'll get there eventually. There's that first sidebar. So I didn't need to know anything about CSS to do that, which is pretty cool for a lot of people starting out with with whatever they're doing. It's a you know great learning resource. Um, yes. Did I misunderstand you? Didn't you say you wanted the sidebar? You do that content at zero. Mm -hmm. The sidebar is the um, the sidebar is first in display on the widescreen when you're looking at all of the elements together. But once you go to single column, it just takes it by display weight. It doesn't push it. It doesn't move it to the top there. So it's because you're going into single column. Now you're just going into the order that they're listed in the code. Right. Um, that's the weight is how they're you're right. Correct. Weight is how they're listed in the code and position is how they're listed on the page once you start getting into wider screens. Yeah. Yes? So usually uh, set the weight first, then you know, set position? Or yes, position? so that, that's a good question. So the question was, do you usually set weight first and then set position? And uh, the answer to that is yes, because by default, weight is the only option that you're going to see. 
So I'm glad that you asked that because you actually have to tell Omega that you want to mess with positions in order to do so. So to do that, going back into this content section, into the content zone, before the regions, we were just looking at regions, is this configuration section. And in the configuration section, you'll actually see custom region positioning right here. That is not checked by default. So in order to play with the position, you're going to have to check that off. Yeah. So that's a very good question. A couple of other things to, to notice in here. Force equal heights for all child elements. That's what's allowing this sidebar to be as tall as the content area. If I don't have equal heights enabled, then it won't do that. Equal heights is not an option that you'll see available to you by default either. In order to get to that, you need to go under Toggle Libraries and actually enable the Equal Heights Library. The Formalize and Media Queries libraries come enabled by default, and because you're doing responsive, I don't recommend you turn them off. Um, equal Heights, only enable if you need it, because Equal Heights does add some load to your performance. It is a, a library, it is kind of hefty. So if your design requires it, here's where you can enable it. If it doesn't require it, then you're in even better shape. Great. Okay, so the other thing, the other thing that we should look at here is, um, you'll notice when we go into these regions that you have all these things, the, uh, the zone, you can actually change a zone that a particular um, that a particular region is in. But then you have these things that are called prefix with suffix. And those are also very valuable to you. So right now, what you'll notice is sidebar first has a width of two columns. Content has a width of six columns. And sidebar second has a width of three columns. So this Sidebar first right here is taking up two columns out of that grid. Let's go back to the grid here. So it's taking up two columns. Whatever I've set to those column widths, it's taking up two of those. The content area is given permission to take up six, unless sidebar second doesn't exist, in which case it'll just take up whatever space it has available to it. But I can also change that. Prefix and suffix in the 960 grid world are called gutters. And again, this is important to know because if you're researching 960 on your own and you start seeing those words and looking for them in Omega, they are called something different in Omega. So gutters are prefix and suffix in Omega. And I really kind of want, want to walk away from this microphone, but um, I'll, I'll just talk as loud as I can. So if you're going to do a gutter um, or, or a prefix or a suffix on your, on your regions, what's going to happen is it's going to, a gutter is going to leave one of these columns empty, or two or three. If your gutter is three columns, it'll leave three empty. Or if your prefix or suffix is three columns, it'll leave those empty. So we're going to look at that with this section down here. Right now, Omega comes with, by default, with four postscripts enabled. And I'm taking up three of those four postscripts. It's also, everything's kind of running together. It, it looks a little smushed. So to make that a little bit cleaner, what I want to do is get rid of that fourth one because I'm never going to use it. And I want to give these some gutters. And I also, sidebar first has the most content, or sorry, prefix first has the most content. So I want to make sure that it has a little bit more space than the other two so that I can... Um, so that everything balances out. So I'm going to go into my configuration here, and I'm going to collapse things so that we can see better. So now I'm heading into the postscript zone, and I'm looking at my regions here. The first thing that I want to do is get rid of postscript fourth. I'm never going to use it. I don't want clients using it, so it's going to go away. So I'm going to take it just like I would do with a block, I'm changing postscript to none. So with a block, you would say put it in this region or put it in none, and now it's gone. So this works exactly the same way. 
So now I don't need to worry about that. That's gone. Once I save this, it'll disappear from here. But for my other three, I want to determine their gutters, their width, their prefix, and their suffix. So what I'm going to do, I believe, I thought I had already done the math, but it looks like I didn't. So we'll try to get this right here. So the first thing I want to do is I kind of want this balancing more to the middle. So I'm going to give postscript first a prefix of one, of one column. I'm going to leave it at two columns, or sorry, three columns for width. And then I'll give it a suffix of one column. So now my math says that this particular postscript, postscript first, is taking up five of my 12 columns. And I need to keep that in mind before I set the others. I have that, based on that, I have seven columns left. So now I'll go into second, and I'll say, okay, this one, because postscript first has a suffix of one of, one of those columns, I don't need to give it a prefix. It's already going to have some, some cushion. But I want the width to be two columns. And then I won't give it a suffix. I'm just going to give the I'm going to give postscript third a prefix, so that it also gives it some some space. So now I'll go here and I'll give this two columns, and then I'll give it a prefix of one and a suffix of one, so that they all balance out together. So now this one's taking up four columns, this one's taking two, and this one's taking five, which isn't doesn't equal twelve. So now I know. Postscript first can have another column, and I'll give it four columns because I want that to have the most space. So once I save this, I can go back over here, and we can see how this changes. So now Postscript first has a nice four columns there. It has a little bit of cushion on the left. It has some cushion on the right. Postscript second has two columns. Postscript third has two columns and a little bit of cushion on the left and the right. And that's all done through prefix and suffix. It's 1040. I need to wrap up shortly, and there's a billion other things that I wanted to show you. Um, so I'm just going to show you really quickly the style sheet logic because that's incredibly important to Omega. And, um, and then if there's other things that you wanted to know about, you can ask you, you can ask questions. So let's pop over here to the style sheet logic. In your Omega theme, your CSS files, you have five CSS files for your Omega theme. Global.css is the CSS file that's going to impact everything on your site, including the mobile display. This is where you want to begin. If you don't begin here, and when you begin here and you're, and you're working on your site, what you should do is actually work like this and begin with global.css. Save yourself the pain. I've done this too many times, and it really does increase your development time substantially. Don't work like this when you're starting with your Omega theme. Just don't do it. <laughs> Work like this, get global.css perfect, and then move up to your next size. And then work there, get that to what you want, and then move up to your next size. Now the nice thing is you'll know, because of the way that Omega breaks up its style sheets, you won't have to worry that whatever you do in this layout will break whatever you've done in the mobile layout. Because the mobile layout only looks at global.css. As you start to get bigger, this is basically your tablet layout. It looks at global.css first, and then it looks at narrow for over, sorry, it looks at default for overrides, and it'll also look at narrow, but default is your kind of your next everything point. That's the next style sheet that you want to work with. So first you're going to work with global.css, then you're going to work with default, and then you're going to go on to narrow, and then as you get wider, normal, and then you know if you have a super large screen, you'll be looking at wide. And in your configuration for your Omega theme, you can also change the breakpoints that you're using in your grid settings. So you can 
go into here and actually change what those breakpoints are if you want something custom. I saw a question over here. So the mobile only goes to global, there's nothing like the balance sheet for that? Nope. Global's going to affect everything, and that's the idea behind the Omega. That's one of the reasons why it's great for really getting you thinking responsive, because you have to think about mobile first. And whatever you do to mobile happens to everything else until you override it. Yeah, so very, very useful. So one other thing that I want to mention before I open up for questions is definitely look into, we didn't get to talk about the delta and the context modules in relation to how they work with omega-3, uh, but definitely look into those because what Delta allows you to do is create different theme settings. So this whole theme setting area that we've been in, where you say I want PostScript to be three, not four, I want these gutters, all of that stuff, you can actually create a completely different setting in Delta and then use context to assign it to different sections of your site. So that's incredibly valuable as well. Um, it's time to open up for questions. And uh, pop over here. Um, I promised some helpful resources, the URLs. So that 960 grid blog post is from six revisions, and the URL is up here. Um, also valuable whenever you're theming is the TPL file naming conventions, which you'll need to know for overriding templates. Um, and then the Omega handbook and an overview of Omega 3 versus 4, which will be useful as well. Any questions? Why yes? Did, why did you say we're doing Omega 3 versus 4? Because this is a beginner session, and Omega 3 is an incredibly valuable tool for beginners. Omega 4 is not for beginners. It's more intermediate advanced theming. Yes? Um, what do you think is going to happen to the tool set if Omega 4 goes forward? Do you think you preserve in some fashion, or is it just a small? So I sure hope so. Uh, right now they're looking for a maintainer for the Omega 3 uh, theme. The people who are working on Omega are all now interested in Omega 4. And um, what, what I would like, this is what I would like to see happen. Uh, again, it depends on who steps up. Um, and, and actually makes whatever will happen, happen. I would like to see Omega 4 become the Omega that everyone uses, but have a module like Omega Tools that expands to include all of the stuff that Omega 3 has that is optional for those people who really want to use that particular tool set. Because as far as I know, I could be wrong, but I don't think that there's anything else out there that makes theming this easy for the kinds of use cases that we were discussing. Yeah, because I have a nonprofit, and mm -hmm. our consultants built our website in Omega and gave us Omega tools, and it's really helpful for people who want to use it. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. I, hopefully, somebody, maybe somebody in this room steps up and takes over Omega-3. Um, that would be great. Or at least that tool set. It's very valuable. Other questions? Yes? Do you know if the uh, grid is extendable at all? Like, able to pull in other grid systems? The 960 grid in Omega-3? Uh, yeah, I mean, just like, you know, shutting that off and then possibly pulling in another grid system. Is that possible? You can. I've never done it, so I don't know what the process would be with with using it, but you can say you don't want to use the 960 grid. You can change things. At that point, though, you're kind of customizing to the point where you might just use Omega's inspiration and turn it into your own thing. Um, has anyone else done that? You have. <laughs> um, the response to that. So the question for, for the purpose of the recording was uh, kind of getting rid of the 960 grid and pulling in another grid. and um, and another audience member has done it and says it's horrible. <laughs> the experience was horrible. <laughs> um, Omega 4 is supposed to be really good at taking in whatever grid system you want to work with, um, at least from what I've looked at so far. Um, just to kind of quickly show you how different 
omega-4 looks out of the box. Now you saw what omega-3 looked like out of the box. This is what omega-4 looks like out of the box. And it doesn't really have much in the way of configuration. It, that's about it. So it's a very different tool set, completely different. Any other questions? Can you start off with omega-3 uh, to begin with a, a three, six months, a year from now, whatever you want to then uh, convert it to omega-4? Is that possible? So the question was if you start with omega-3 and then uh, six months or a year from now you want to convert to omega-4, is that possible? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if anyone in this room does. Because, um, and if you do, please raise your hand. The, the fact is that the two tool sets, the two, they're, they're completely different themes. The file system is completely different. I don't see how they would be compatible. I, they re they're really so different. Yes? No, there, there might not be a path to migrate, but you could certainly start with Omega 3 and then build your theme in Omega 4 or anything else. Mm -hmm. So audience response was there might be a migration path at some point, but no, probably know. not. Um, no, right, that, that there probably won't be a migration path. Sorry, no, there, absolutely um, won't be. there absolutely won't be. But that you could start with omega three and then start working on an omega four theme when you're ready to and. Uh, that, that's a fair guess. And they're, they're completely different tool sets. They're night and day different. It's like using Omega-3 versus Omega-4 is like using Omega-3 versus Zen. They're, they're different themes. Yeah. Yes? Uh, just a clarification. You are committed to a particular theme, it sounds like, when you're starting. You might choose Omega-3 or Zen, let's say. Mm -hmm. I'm stuck with that. That is how my site moves forward. Is that correct? Sort of. So the question was, if you choose a particular theme, are you you're committed to that theme? That is what your site is going to use. Is that true? And the answer to that is is kind of yes and kind of no. The the yes part is you're putting work into that theme, and it's going to be a nice theme, and that's the theme that you built with that starting point. But the great thing about Drupal is that you, with a click of a button, you just put in a new theme. So if you want to move to another theme, you know, two years down the line, you change your branding, you, you want to use a different tool set, you started with something that wasn't responsive, you want it to be responsive. While your site lives with that initial theme that you built, you start working on your new theme, and you can actually have both themes running to, in the site at the same time. And uh, there's a great little module called Switch Theme, which you can you know, set for administrators to look at so that you can switch between the two themes. and and see the differences while you're working. Um, so it's very, you know, it's a click of a button to change a theme. To build a theme, that's a different story. But to change a theme, it's a click of a button. <laughs> um, all right, we're a couple minutes left. So if the new presenter's here and want to start, wants to start setting up, I'm totally fine with that while we answer questions. Yes? Um, do you know there's any kind of performance test or called the uh, tools or anything that are enabled with it? And if so, can you turn them off? Like so you could turn off, yes, you could turn off Omega tools. You wouldn't turn off Delta because Delta is actually doing something um, in the site while, while it's running. Um, Omega can get fairly heavy. So it, um, so that is, that, that can be an issue. You do want to look at your performance. You want to do whatever you can to optimize. Any theme can get heavy. I mean, tw I've seen, a, we have a site running with a Twitter bootstrap based theme and um, that's that got really heavy for a while so any theme can get heavy depending on what you're running in it and this one no more or less than others um, you just need to watch it and and tame it where you can yeah other questions yes Well, your styles, your styles are compatible. Um, you know, you might need to change your selector, but the style sheet structure is different across different themes. The Zen style sheet structure is completely different from. Oh no! Oh, you mean for Omega three and Omega four? No, completely different. The style sheet structure is is completely different in Omega four. 
from omega-3. There's, there's no similarity. Um, here's my contact information. If, if any of you would like to ask further questions, we do have to wrap up. Um, next presenter, if you are here, please feel free to come up and set up. <laughs> and, uh, and then we, Cherry Hill Company does have a few more sessions. Uh, unfortunately, one of them is right now, so it just happened. Uh, but we have a panel on responsive base themes that is going to have a number of great panelists, including Jeremy, who's sitting right here. And I thought I saw one of the other panelists. Um, but So um, that's a great one if you are looking at doing responsive sites and trying to figure out which theme to use. Come to the panel at 2.30 right here. Um, and then we also have a sassy, Get Sassy with CSS, which is just getting started with SAS, um, a fancy title for that. 1.30 also here. And then tomorrow, Ashok has two sessions, um, one about Jenkins and one about Drupal 8, working with Drupal 8. Those are advanced sessions. So enjoy. Have a great camp. <laughs>